I'd love to go into, you know, deep, deeper uh, rabbit holes of questions which have either been ignored or not really paid attention to. And that is especially, you know, the chapter of, uh, you know, nation state government, especially the military industrial corporate intelligence complex. What are they going to do? How are they going to react once the pain point is reached? Once, you know, we reach a certain threshold of whatever market capitalization, hyper-Bitcoinization, whatever you can call. So I'm really looking forward to my talk with John Silvestro. Shout out to Eric Basco, who uh, he connected me with. And we're going to go deep into all kinds of tangents. So without further ado, this is uh, my talk with John Silvestro. Hope you're going to enjoy this as much. Please, if you do, uh, give it a like, follow, subscribe, and give it a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. Thank you so much again. And if you have any questions, comments, please DM me or email me at kd at kvandavani.com. And welcome to the show, the Kvandavani Connection. Welcome to the show, John Silvestro. Been really looking forward to this talk, John. Um you know, I got to uh, give a shout out to Eric Raskul who connected me with you. We talk, we, we already talked, the two of us already talked uh, privately. So, hi, how are you doing, John? Uh, good. Yeah, yeah, very good. I'm glad you, uh, I'm glad Eric was able to connect us. Um, I met Eric a few years ago at a Bitcoin scaling conference at Stanford, and he and I have kept in touch ever since. Yeah, uh, I know oh. him pretty well. Yeah, I even, I even was at the conference you organized in Vietnam, and He's okay. like a super brilliant guy. I don't know where he channels all his knowledge and his no, intelligence from, but <laughs> he's somewhat he was, it's amazing. He was one of the original guys who kind of sat me aside and was like, you know, come with me, young man. Like, I'll tell you what this is really all about. Really? And, uh, when was that? Like, how many years ago? Like, this was what, 20, this was the beginning of 2017 when wow. uh, at the Scaling Bitcoin Conference, when mm -hmm. I went uh, and I was brand new at the time, just sort of learning. Uh, and I was speaking with somebody else and they, we were talking about background and whatnot. And I said, uh, you know, I told him I was in the military. He's like, Oh, you got to meet Eric. And then Eric and I started talking and, and I had some misconceptions about the, you know, the beginnings of Bitcoin and what it was and why it was like everybody else. Yeah. Right. Everybody else. And he <laughs> took me, and sat me down and we sat down for almost six hours. I think. Yeah, <laughs> full course, crash course. <laughs> and Eric just, you know, dumped his, uh, <laughs> did, his you it all at and, once? did you absorb you know, it? I came out, once? I came out a different person. Well, so, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like it's a fucking psychedelic you know. experience. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. I got the original right. one too. Yeah. yeah oh. I, I got it in Vietnam. I, I think I understand about half of it, but you know, it's still good to know. He's like super rational, everything. Yeah. Right. You know, there's a tendency, I think of people, at least in the beginning, I felt like that. It's like when I listen to, to you know, it's not like you you feel and think differently afterwards, but it's like, it's like you got to breathe and, and you know, and, and think to yourself, okay, uh, is Bitcoin, you know, going to survive? You know, it's like, it's not, it's, it's not like, um, you know, um, it's like, it's not like going into pessim pessimism, but it's yeah. it's pretty hardcore, you know. Knowledge you got to think it through rationally, logically. You know what are the yeah. attack vectors and everything else. So that discussion we had, you know, with together with Dave Collum, Eric Kaysen, and Eric Roscoe was really, I mean, mind blowing. I had to yeah. re-listen to it like three times. <laughs> so John, back to you. Um, yeah. Why don't you tell my listeners, you know, a little bit about your journey and sure. background? Yeah. So I I come from a. a well, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the Marine Corps. I'm active duty Marine officer uh, now. Uh, but I come from a bit of a econ, uh, it was an econ major in college uh, when I worked in sort of finance a little bit when I was in college. I, I was, a, you know, interned at a hedge fund uh, and a venture capital firm when I was in college. And then when I graduated, uh, I did, I worked for a venture capital firm uh, for a little while and then eventually ended up working for one of the startups that we had uh, helped uh, fund. And so... I kind of came from that world, sort of got disillusioned with it, uh, wasn't finding any real purpose, um, and ended up joining, ended up becoming a Marine officer, going to uh, OCS uh, over 10 years ago now, and eventually becoming a Marine Corps officer and pilot, and so that's what I do now. I'm an I'm a, uh, aviator uh, in the United States Marine Corps, but during that time, I also continue to invest. I run a small um, a small families and friends fund now uh, that has been doing well. And, and so that's sort of what I've been doing with my time outside of the military. Uh, but in that time as a Marine officer, I've deployed twice to Afghanistan. I've, I've been to the Philippines uh, to do humanitarian aid relief efforts. Um, 
And when I met Eric, I, I was serving in San Francisco and uh, got a chance to go down the rabbit hole in 2017. And uh, yeah, and so 2017 is when I started, uh, founded my fund a little over a year ago. Uh, and it's been doing, you know, been doing well. Obviously, the market helps with that sort of thing uh, with Bitcoin. And other than that, I, I'm just a generally orange pilled human being who's been trying to spread the word as much as I possibly can. I feel like every time I get my feet underneath me, they get kicked out again and I fall farther and farther down uh, the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And, and uh, yeah, so, so Eric and I, like I said, we met a few years ago and he really kind of set me on the path of uh, understanding it at a different level that I, I don't think would have been possible without sort of people like him uh, and their guidance and, and understanding fully what we were looking at and, and, and really, uh, yeah. So that's, that's my background. That's my story. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Before we go into the specific of my questions, like when did, when was the first time you, you, you know, you faced that, that root question, what is money, you know, what is fundamentally wrong with the money system? Because, you know, it's, it's inevitably when you deal with Bitcoin for the first time, you got to go into like so many rabbit holes. What was like, is, was there like, like an enlightening moment or, or a Eureka moment? Well, yeah. So I, I think, I think everybody, I, I don't know, certainly in my case, I always had this sense. So I was, I was in New York in 2008 when the financial crisis happened. So I, I got to watch kind of firsthand as people, uh, you could feel that, you, you know, New York City is, is alive in a way and you can sense the, what's happening uh, even if you're not in the middle of a financial, you know, even if you're not sitting on uh, Wall Street or sitting on a trading desk or anything, but you could feel the difference in the city and you could feel that there was a change happening. Um, and there, there was sort of always this underlying sense of, of this, th th this doesn't feel right, this doesn't feel, uh, you know, we're going to, there was this sense of, okay, we're going to give this money that we're going to print out of nowhere. And, and uh, I won't say that I started digging down into anything at that point, but I think everybody sort of has this feeling that there's something wrong in the underpinnings of the reality that we live in. Uh, and so uh, I would, I would say the first time I heard about Bitcoin was 2013. My brother sent me an article. I think I dismissed it as uh you know, video game money, video game tokens, things like that. Uh, 2015, my good friend, uh, Josh Davis, who was a very early Bitcoin adopter, uh, kind of pulled me aside and we started talking about it. And, and, you know, I think like, like a lot of people, I said, okay, cool. I'm going to put $10,000 in at, you know, 200 bucks and, you know, it never happened for whatever reason. And, and, uh, and then finally in 2017, uh, I think it was the election, the elections in, uh, in the U S Donald Trump becoming uh, president of the United States and sort of looking at, okay, this is a symptom of something that I haven't grasped, uh, or, or it hasn't really faced me directly. Um, what is, what is wrong with, you know, and, and, I, and, and just watching the political system in general, right. I used to be very politically uh, minded and sort of plugged in and, uh, watching the election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and, and sort of feeling this ennui about, you know, neither of these candidates are, are particularly exciting to me. This is the best we can do. Maybe there's another answer out there. Um, and so I think then in the beginning of 2017, as the price started to rise, started paying more attention. Um, and I think the aha moment for me was the, per the permissionless nature of Bitcoin, right? So uh, up until that point, there was no alternative. If you had to play by the rules and if you didn't live in a certain place or you weren't of a certain race or you weren't of a certain nationality or you didn't have access to, uh, you had no, there, you had no way to access any of these things. And, uh, and I've been to some of the poorest places in the world. Um, and I think seeing that firsthand in Afghanistan and realizing the power of the idea that if the most brilliant entrepreneur in the world happens to be born in Afghanistan, they have no way to access funds, the banking system, uh, other entrepreneurs, other ideas, and, and the birth of both the internet and now a permissionless monetary system really gives power to everybody. Um, you know, I don't, I, I won't say that Bitcoin necessarily completely levels the playing field. There's no such thing as, you know, you show me, show me, uh, you know, perfect, a perfect equality system and I'll show you a failed communist state. Right. So, uh, 
but I do think that it, it gives power to the individual in a way that the current system we have does not. And so uh, that was the first realization, right? Was this, this permissionless system has a power to open up the possibilities of humanity. Uh, and I've seen the worst of humanity. And so that led me into sort of that first step of, okay, maybe there's something to this, maybe there's something powerful about this. And then I continued to uh, journey down, um, I think, uh, you know, reading the internet of money and, and mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Santanopoulos was some of the first sort of aha moments that I had. Then I read Digital Gold, um, and then I read some Parker Lewis, and then uh, Bullish Case for Bitcoin, and then you know, on and on and on and on and on. I now got a stack of Bitcoin books, and I, you know, I listen. I think Trace Mayer, you know, for for whatever's happened to him since Trace Mayer's uh, Bitcoin <laughs> Knowledge Podcast, yeah, was great back then. You know, yeah, it, he lost it, himself, it's... but but to be honest with you, I mean, I got to give credit to him. He he was one of the real early ones who understood the fundamentals of Bitcoin and really right. preached the, you know, the ESOS on the fundamentals. And then, I don't know, he got lost into this mimbo wimbo, whatever bullshit. Well, and, you know, and I, I, will, I will continue to have my heroes. Uh, you know, people say similar things about Andreas, that he's a multi-coiner yeah. now or yeah. whatever. But, you know, Andreas is a tinkerer. And he, if without him, there's no way I would have gotten here as quickly right. as I did. Exactly. Um, and so... And and I, and I, you know don't don't burn your heroes just because they become uh, false prophets eventually like yeah no I just thought it was disappointing because you know I mean uh, I live up I mean I would say I would live up to to the principles of my ethos you know um, whatever that is in every regard but anyway uh, John I mean you know I wanted to talk to you about um, you know you 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 brilliantly described your journey and we could go into all kinds of tangents tangent away my man I'm ready. Yeah, was there any time like when you when you recognize or you comprehend it for yourself? Okay, these are the symptoms and these are the root causes. And if we change or transform the root uh, money <laughs> in it and by itself, then everything else structurally, because this is what I'm really fascinated by or interested in, the structural transformation of human civilization in every regard regard you know we'd be, be economically scientifically technologically you know i mean generally structurally and i think you know when you listen to all these you know brilliant minds whether it be jeff booth or safed and amus or you know all these people who, yeah. who, who 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 you know who also know the history when uh, you know once upon a time we had sort of a hard money gold standard la belle epoque whatever that's was called and then you know the power of technology was unleashed you know so this is what i'm really fascinated in and because you have you know a military background i was thinking to ask you first what do you think is the sentiment like what do you think i mean when you talk to whatever per military personnel be, be i don't know contractors personnel soldiers or whoever What's the sentiment in the military? I mean, towards money, towards the money system, towards, uh, you know, war, national security, defense. It's your stage. Just, you know yeah, what? I, well, yeah. I'll, say, I'll say this. I, so I was, a, I was a big supporter of, of Barack Obama. Um, and, and he was part of, it's actually part of the reason I, I joined the military because it was, it, there was sort of this, at that time, 2008, there was this failing of the financial system and sort of this call to service. And uh, I really had a lot of faith that we, maybe we had somebody who could change things. And, and, and as much as I, as much as I liked them, as much as I liked the man, uh, Barack Obama, I realized his, his eight years of presidency really made me question, okay, if we can't, if the system can't be changed with, uh, with somebody that I, that I thought had the character and, and the charisma to change the system, then the system can't be changed through that nature it doesn't matter who you vote in to be president of the united states the system is not set up in a way and so i think it was it was hit you know for lack of a better word the failure of the obama administration and that uh well i'll say the failure to fundamentally change uh the things that i felt were wrong about the united states uh was an eye-opening experience for me of okay so that didn't change anything particularly uh, in the ways that I hoped. Then we have to change everything. And, and I think, you know, as I've gone farther down the rabbit hole, you get farther away from the person you used to be and more to, more to the, pe the person you've become today. And I still talk to people, you know, my brothers, for instance, uh, I have a twin brother. Um, he's very much still in that mindset of like, if we can just tweak the system correctly, 
we just get the right people in place, then we can make a make a better change. And, and I and I that's where I came from, right? That's how I used to feel. Uh, and and I think that my I have changed in a lot of ways in that in that regard. I, it is it is clear to me that there is no way to tweak the current system. Uh, to you, you need to so. So in that, it's good because I do have somebody that I care about and people around me that I care about that do still feel that way. And talking to them solidifies my feelings about uh, Bitcoin and, and what's possible for the future. And uh, and the farther you go and you realize, okay, uh, they're printing away our value. There is this new system that you know, if, if you look at, I think I remember there was a number that, that I used to quote, which is basically, right, since the Medici's, you know, founded uh, central banking and really, you know, double entry bookkeeping, um, that created a renaissance and it allowed people to, uh, to function and flourish in a way that was not possible before. Well, now we have a new system that is, you know, whether you call it triple entry bookkeeping or zero entry bookkeeping, uh, we have a new system in Bitcoin that we know we no longer need that trusted third party, right? And so with double entry bookkeeping, we 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 gave all this power to a central authority because it helped us transact and, and create commerce that was not possible beforehand. Uh, and we paid them a hefty sum to do that. You know, some estimates are almost one third of our monetary system goes into securing our financial certain right so whether it's central banks or bankers in general or the credit system and credit cards or loans whatever it is basically a third of all human capital goes into that system well i mean just imagine with bitcoin now you can you can erase almost all of that security and put it into into bitcoin into into the blockchain that is bitcoin and you know it, it, it's it's not zero in terms of security but it's certainly not one third of all human capital right and that unleashes that means all we get all of that energy back all the individuals get that energy back which means we don't have to focus on uh necessarily we don't have to focus on paying the bills in the same way we don't have to focus on a job that we don't care about we don't have to focus on uh creating administrators on top of administrators on top of administrators we can focus on on truly freeing human capital to allow the individual to focus on the things that are important. And like you said, unlocking the potential of human, human beings, all human beings. So instead of uh, going to a nine to five job, we now accrue value through our monetary system. We can, if, if I wanna be an artist, I can be an artist. If I, wanna, if I wanna focus on quantum mechanics because that's my hobby and that's what I like to do, I can focus on quantum mechanics. You can unlock things that we can't fathom yet. It, it, it's, a, it's a complete shift in, in the base reality that we live in. Uh, and that's, that's what really excites me. Now, you're, in terms of your question for the military industrial complex, um, I think that I would say I am, I am relatively an anomaly in terms of uh, the beliefs that I have about Bitcoin and what it can do for, for the world, right? So I'm, that, I'm still just like most people who work in a nine to five job, I think. Uh, I'm still that crazy guy who all he talks about is Bitcoin and you know, I have, I literally have a conspiracy binder. theories in a minute. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, not quite, not quite conspiracy. There's just, I'm just the Bitcoin guy, right? Okay. I'm, I'm the Bitcoiner, you know, people come to my office and they're like, Hey, I heard, you know, especially this year because the price is going up. So people are paying attention again, you know, people are like, Oh, I heard you're into Bitcoin. Can you talk to me about, you know, and I've, I've probably orange pilled, you know, I, I, I won't say I've orange pilled that many people. I will say that I have helped a lot of people buy Bitcoin this year. Um, Getting into the kinds of levels of conversation that you and I are having right now uh, crosses a border that most people are not ready to, to cross. And, and, I, and I heard a great quote the other day, which I love, which is like, uh, so Alice wasn't shoved down the rabbit hole. She had to follow the white rabbit on her own. You can't shove somebody down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. It's, it, you, can, you can give them books. You can tell them a few things. You can give them resources. But you have to, you have to fall down the rabbit hole yourself. You can't shove somebody down there without their, you know, they'll, they'll find a route, they'll crawl back out, they will fight you the whole way down. You have to descend on your own, you have to fall on your own. Um, and, I, and I really like that. I think that's, that's because people, you know, people ask me that all the time, like, how do I, you know, how do I learn more? Or, uh, or what can I learn more? Or, or people who, who are like me, when I have conversations, they're like, man, I, I'm having so much trouble getting my brother to understand her. I'm having so much trouble getting my mom or dad to understand it. And, you know, the, the reality of trying to do this for four years, 
you know, I think my success rate is like, you know, less than one in a hundred at this point in terms of, you know, really converting somebody into a true Bitcoin believer, you know, and uh, uh, that's because you can't, you can't force anybody. You have to let them kind of fall on their own. And so uh, that's, that's been my journey. Uh, but I, I think, you know, again, sorry, get back to military industrial complex. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a pro American. I think America still represents something special in the world. Uh, but, but the problem with permissionless money is you have to adopt it uh, in order to benefit from it. Um, and so I fear that the U.S. is going to continue to, like many of the people that I've talked to about Bitcoin, think that they can ignore it, think that they can think it away, hope that if they just say, you know, that doesn't exist and put up their blinders that it will disappear. Uh, and it's just not the case. As we know, there is a black hole of monetary energy sucking in the world and it's called Bitcoin. And it is already won, it's 12 years in. Uh, it will continue to suck in more and more monetary energy. And with that, it will continue to suck in the power that is held by certain individuals unless they adopt it. I think the best thing the US government could do right now is buy half a you know half a billion bitcoin or half a million bitcoin and put it in cold storage as a just in case you know as satoshi nakamoto or as, as hal finney said you should get some just to just in case this catches on uh well guess what it's caught on <laughs> it's caught on at this point uh and the longer you delay that adoption the the, the dip, more difficult it's going to be for you to uh, participate in the future that we're building okay um Let's talk about the, the, the fiat system and especially about the US dollar as the dominant, dominating you know, uh, international reserve currency. And even you know, Paul Krugman, you know, <laughs> I think the alleged, is, it, is he a Nobel Prize winner, whatever. So he oh, said, no, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't he say sometime that the dollar, the fiat is, is backed by men with guns, right? Yes. Yeah. No, so, I, I, uh, yeah. So yeah, there is the there's inherent violence in the system. Um, there is inherent violence in the current system we have. Uh, Marines in general are, uh, you know, our job our job is to go and and end the uh, end the lives of those who are deemed enemies of America. That's what the United States Marine Corps does. Uh, anybody who tells you differently. Uh, doesn't understand what we do for a living. Um, and that's, that's our mission and, that, and that's what we do well and that's what we're trained to do. Um, and with that, like you said, the, the, the system that we help protect is that fiat system, right? We, we are, oh, excuse me one second. I gotta close that blind. Sun just came up over my head. Um, and so, you know, we, we help protect um, and, you know, and it's and it's it's on top of you know the American military what we do, um, but it's also the power of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency around the world because it's not just you know there are no there are no Marines in in uh, Argentina forcing Argentinian um, citizens to use the U.S. dollar right it is the dominant currency because it is the reserve currency of the world and people want it people will continue to want it. Uh, I think for, for quite a while, but you know, at the same time, you're seeing people start to adopt a different standard. They're starting to adopt a Bitcoin standard. Um, I think that it's, I think that, you know, we are coming up against this great filter where it is difficult to see what the future really looks like. And, and I don't know what a Marine Corps or, a, or an American military looks like in that Bitcoin future. I think there's still going to be a demand for security. There's still going to be a demand for uh, for people to do jobs that, that need to be done. Um, and I, and I don't know exactly how that's going to face, you know, will there be private militaries? Will there be, uh, you know, will, will nation states exist in the same way that we see them today? Um, will there be citadels around the world where people, you know, either have Bitcoin or don't have Bitcoin? I mean, uh, I, I think, you know, I read a long time ago, a, a great book by Ray Kurzweil, The Singularity is Near, 2005, you know, fantastic book. I think 
uh, of all the things that were relatively unrelated to Bitcoin that prepared me for Bitcoin, I think reading that book uh, really sort of got me into the idea of, of parabolic technology. Um, and I think we are approaching a singularity now with Bitcoin, right? Uh, it is getting more and more difficult to see through that, that singularity of a Bitcoin future. We are, we are coalescing and, and converging on uh, a breakthrough that is very difficult to predict past the future. You know, Ray used uh, artificial intelligence as that singularity. Uh, and, you know, maybe Bitcoin is an artificial intelligence in some form, but, but maybe, you know, maybe Bitcoin is that, that, uh, that filter that gets more and more difficult to see, okay, let's say tomorrow the entire world adopts a Bitcoin standard uh, or adopts Bitcoin. Every single person in the world no longer wants dollars. Everybody gets uh, Bitcoin. Every Bitcoin is worth a hundred million dollars a coin. What does that world look like? And, and uh, it's something I've thought a lot about. Um, I have some ideas, but, but making any kind of real predictions, I think is a bit of a fool's errand. Uh, but it is interesting to think about. Um, I think Paul Krugman uh, makes an interesting point. I, I think that uh, the American military and, and militaries around the world in general are becoming, are transforming in a way that is even hard to, to determine as somebody who serves as the American military. I mean, we saw, we saw airstrikes in Syria the other day. Um, the, the idea of large land armies storming the beaches of nations seems uh difficult to comprehend that that would be the kind of future that we would live in again uh i think that you're seeing cyber warfare being the predominant military actions uh as we move forward uh i think that you know and, and the commandant of the marine corps has said you know he'd like to see the marine corps become a smaller more efficient uh force i think that that is sort of the way of the future for the american military is a small more efficient force and continuing to uh increase lethality while decreasing the risk of of men and women that we put in harm's way um and and i think that we will see bitcoin greatly transform that unless and 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 i think that um i would like to see the u.s adopt that as as quickly as possible um and we'll see i mean I made this. I made the, the comment yesterday. Uh, there is nothing that I know about that will be true in a hundred years. Almost nothing that I can predict. I do not know if there will be a United States military. I don't know if there will be United States. I don't know if we will come up with technology to build a new continent in the middle of Pacific Ocean. I don't know if we will be a interplanetary or intergalaxy species in a hundred years. But I do know exactly how many Bitcoin there will be. Right. And so when people say. Uh, Bitcoin is unstable or it is too volatile. Uh, that is the argument that I make is that it's, to me, it's the most stable thing I can think of. There is nothing else that I know about a uh, hundred years from today, but I, I can tell you almost for certain how many Bitcoin there will be in the universe. Uh, you know, whether those Bitcoin be traded just here on the, on the, in the U S or, or sorry, just here in, in, on earth, or if they'll be traded between here and Mars, or they'll be traded between here and some unforeseen uh, wormhole that we've discovered and able to uh, use because we, guess what? We discovered some quark in uh, the Large Hadron Collider that gives us teleportation powers and we've uh, determined how to use quantum entanglement to ch transform galaxies away from, who knows what the world's gonna look like in a hundred years. Um, but I do know that Bitcoin will be here and I know almost how many there will be you know, to the day. I know there will be, well, let's see, 100 years from now, 2120, we'll be down to the last Bitcoin. The last Bitcoin, yeah. fractions yeah. of the last Bitcoin exactly. will be mine. I think you tweeted That's even it. about that, like, we'll be down to the last Bitcoin. like 40 years for the last one Bitcoin to, I mean, it's, right. it's like mind boggling. So, okay, John, I mean, you know, when, when uh, whoever, you know, military uh, people, like soldiers, Marines, they, when they go into service, they yep. make a, what do you call it? They make an oath, like they swear an oath to the constitution. That's right. And I swear. I live yep. myself in America, you know, I did the Pledge of Allegiance and we talked about this privately, you know, for, for 10 minutes, I think last time. And um, and what I'm trying to get at is like, you know, there's so many words <laughs> in the constitution, the Bill of Rights, you know, in the Pledge of Allegiance. 
why don't we, you know, sit down for a moment, stand still for a moment, each one of us, you know, would it be whoever? I mean, I don't even consider myself as an Iranian. I'm more of a cosmopolitan. I'm a more, uh, you know, universal being. And, and really, I mean, you know, it's nothing wrong with patriotism uh, and, uh, you know, defending one's, uh, you know, uh, property, uh, uh, physical, physicality and, and existence. That's actually the role of the government. That should be the role of the government, right? To protect right. liberty, pursuit of happiness, right? Where, where is that yeah. uh, written? <laughs> so maybe we should, you know, stand still for a moment. And I'm, I was just thinking as we were, you know, talking about, you know, people are getting to you because it's becoming more of a mainstream. You know, like, you know, are you the Bitcoin guy? I mean, I was just thinking, just brainstorming, like, what if, you know, you, you know, you feel so secure in your knowledge one day, very soon, maybe, and you could give like. Um, you know, presentations like speeches to to the people in the military. Like, yeah. why? What is what is money? Like Robert Breedlove does. You know, what is money? Why are we doing this? What is the potential of, uh, once we have this hard and scarcest money that is immutable, decentralized, uh, unconfiscatable, uh, censorship resistant, uh, um, um, censorship resistant? You know, permissionless, right? Yeah. I mean, this is this is like a totally evolutionary thing that people can't even fathom, like the pursuit of happiness, abundance, prosperity, all these things that Jeff Booth also talks about. It's like, you know, this uh, this fiat central banking system of fighting against the gra gravitational field forces. And that is, you know, deflation and te te uh, technology in its nature, in its root is deflationary. So, you know, and my research and my, you know, I've been investigating this, this topic a lot, you know, about the military industrial complex, especially in the United States, where they have compartmentalized, uh, you know, there's this military corporate industrial complex that has been developing technologies that is beyond our imagination. Yep. And I don't, do I have proof? No, I don't have any proof, but there are so many, you know, people, experts, testimonials, you know, there's evidence out there. It's just very fractured. Do you know what I'm getting at? Like, <laughs> like making people aware and conscious and comprehend this is the potential. We, you know, it's no, it's no problem like having a defensive, uh, you know, military with the utmost advanced technological weapons, whatever that is. But, but like, what, what does national security actually mean? The national security is totally perverted. The, the meaning of national security is totally perverted. National security means the well-being of all the people within the United States. They just stick right. to the United States. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I think that uh, I think there's there's a lot of, there's a big shift going on, right? And, and I think there has been um, there's there's inertia in. I mean, you you hit on sort of technology as being this deflationary uh, asset and, and a lot of people that I, you know, I have a lot of friends who are econ PhDs or they've been working in finance for their entire lives. And, and they are, they live in that reality of, no, we need inflation. Inflation is, is good. And, and you need it because it, it, uh, it incentivizes consumer spending and incentivizes a growing economy. Um, and when I point out that when we talk about CPI and we talk about, you know, MIT's uh, billion prices fund and, or billion prices uh, metric and, uh, and they want to point to, well, you know, these things are getting cheaper. Yeah. Some of these things are getting more expensive. And, and when we really boil down to it, I, I always say, you know, okay, what are the three most expensive things you're going to spend on in your entire life? Right. It's going to be your house. It's going to be your healthcare and it's going to be your, your or your child's education. Those are the three things. Right. And if you look at those three metrics, they, they inflate away far greater than uh, the quote unquote one to 2% inflation rate. I think education since the 1980s in America is something like 5.5% per year. Healthcare is 4.7 or 5.1%. Uh, and then, uh, so, the, and then, sorry, I forget the, the third one, I, which either healthcare education is, is inflating away about that as, as well. And so, the three most expensive things, the three things you're going to spend the majority of your money on. And they, they point out, well, the, my television got cheaper or, okay, great. Your television got cheaper. If we didn't have inflationary money, your television would be borderline free at this point, right? Technology is a deflationary asset that can be, um, and, and I, I think a best example of that, that, that we can point at is the difference between NASA and SpaceX right now, right? What NASA and SpaceX are trying to do. So you have a private company with incentives to, lower costs and do it as efficiently as possible. And you have a public company or not a public company, but you have a governmental in entity that 
incurs bloat, incurs expensive uh, pieces, it incurs uh, people that have been in the in the administration forever and their jobs depend on getting people to spend more money or whatnot. So uh, I think I saw the other day, NASA's uh, proposed rocket to get people back into uh, space will cost $2 billion to launch. Elon Musk, SpaceX, once the Starship is completely done, will cost $5 million to launch. $5 million versus $2 billion. That's a fraction. That's like super fraction of that. I mean, that's like saying, hey, I've got this book. I'll sell it to you for two bucks. Or you can buy it for less than less than a half a cent. Like, which one do you want? You know, it's the same book. Um, and so when you look at that and you start putting that into all of the other possible efficiencies in the market, you realize, okay, wait a second. What if we instead of allowing these governments, which, uh, you know, we went from, we went from the Wright brothers to landing on the moon in what, 65 years, I think, right. Or 69, whatever it was, 60, 70 years. Uh, we're now, we're now 120 years past, uh, the invention of, um, uh, of the airplane. Uh, what happens when we really allow, instead of relying on governments to unleash the power of, of human ingenuity, what happens when we put that power into all of the individuals? Um, and, I, and I think that that is a truly, like you said, a deflationary asset, allowing people to truly uh, unleash their potential. There's too many perverted incentives within the military industrial complex to, to truly unleash that and, and have the power of technology take over and really see what we're capable of doing. You know, if we can launch people into space at $5 million a shot and we're not spending $2 billion on launching, you know, two or three astronauts into space, um, what other places can we look at? What happens when there's the first trillionaire Bitcoiner who is, who his, his whole thing is, I want to know the truth of quantum mechanics. And so I'm going to build a, a, uh, a large collider that is the size of, of, the of five Midwest states, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna build it around uh, throughout the entire state of Texas, and we're gonna really truly see what the power of this is. Or you know what? I'm gonna build a space elevator, uh, and we're gonna get it to the to the International Space Station for a fraction of the cost. Um, I just don't think that I think uh, you know if you if you look back in history and you you look at what has been most important to civilizations. Generally speaking, you can almost one for one uh, look at what's the tallest object we've built and that that will show you what the most important thing in our species was, right? So the pharaohs were the most important thing when the Egyptians are around. Uh, you go throughout history and then, you know, so religion takes over. Now the cathedrals are some of the largest buildings in the world. Then comes government. Washington Monument becomes the largest structure in the planet. Uh, and governance is sort of the most important thing. And then now we, we've, we've moved into now banks and then oil. And so banks were the most important structure in the world. The corporation, the corporatization of the world became the most important thing. Oil became the most important thing. Burj Dalab is the largest building in the world. Um, and, and in the West Coast of California, now you've got the largest building in, in California is uh, the um, Salesforce Tower, right? And so tech is really that most important thing. Um, and, and all that to say that I think we've moved into, we moved sort of through this corporatization uh, and now we're moved into tech and tech is becoming or has become sort of this uh, empowering force for the world. So you combine tech with a hard money and you start really, truly unleashing the possibilities of, of all of us. Um, in terms of, you know, the military industrial complex, I think that, you know, I, I really enjoy talking to Marines about, uh, about this. I, I've had many, many conversations uh, with young Marines. Um, you know, for me, the first step with this is always sell it as an investment first, right? That's, that's you get somebody on board, you make the case, you, you know, you use all your economic terms, you talk about the sharp ratio, you talk about an asset that's been growing 200% per year for the last 12 years. Uh, you know, don't miss this because it's, you know, it's continues to grow and it will grow for a very long time. It's like the most tangible thing, right? It's, people, easy, it's, right? it's the onboard, okay. right? You don't start you with the curious. bottom of the rabbit hole. Now you made me curious. What, what kind of questions do they ask me? What, what, what are topics like down the line, like down the rabbit hole when you... <clears throat> yeah. Um, 
so um so yeah i think first the 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 questions are uh i think similar to the the conversation i had with eric which was the security i think everybody wants to know what's the how does this work what's the security how do i know this thing's not gonna die tomorrow right and uh so that's that's always the first question and 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 the example I use is the same one that Eric gave me when we first talked, which is, you know, how do you know your home is secure, right? If you own a house, how do you know your house is secure? Um, and people will say, well, I've got locks on my doors or I've got an alarm system uh, or, uh, you know, I've got a heavy bolt, whatever. And the truth is that none of that really protects your home, right? Because if, if a burglar has infinite time and infinite energy, there's nothing you can do to truly protect your house. They can, they could blow a hole in the side of your house. They can drill through any lock. They can smash through any window, given enough time and energy. There's no one, nothing will protect your home uh, in that way. And your alarm system doesn't work if nobody is on the other end paying attention to that alarm system, right? If you have a closed circuit camera and nobody's watching it, then your house is as good as sitting in the in the middle of a desert with nobody around to, to watch it. So what really protects your home? It's it's the people, right? It's your it's your neighbors, it's the community watch, it's it's the police who get called when the alarm system goes off. And so Eric was like, now imagine your house is is a Bitcoin blockchain. It's essentially like having a million cameras watching your house at all times, and they're incentivized to do so. And anything that goes wrong, they call BS on it, right? Anything that goes wrong, they're ready to pounce and say, no, 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 you know, get away from that house, get away from that window, the police are here, nice try, go away. And so uh, that was, that was, I mean, that's a, that's a very dumbed down and simplified version of what he told me. But th I think that, that, that really makes it click for people is that this network is set up in such a way that there are millions of nodes and miners around the world that are watching and making sure that your money is protected and they are incentivized to do that forever. Um, and so once you kind of, and, and that sort of makes, I think makes people click, right? And then for me, it's, it's the, let's talk about scarcity. Let's talk about real scarcity. And so first you convince people that it is secure and then you convince them that Bitcoin is the most scarce thing in the known universe. Um, Time and time and Bitcoin are the only scarce things that we know, right? And and that's in our little three-dimensional world. And who knows what what other dimensions are out there, or what other scales there are in electromagnetics and whatever else. But let's just say in our known universe, Bitcoin and time are really the two only scarce things. And and they say things like, "Well, that's crazy." You know, what about land? Land is scarce. And you're like, "Well, you know, that's great. Let's go down to San Francisco." And we'll stand at the we'll stand at the edge of the water in San Francisco and realize that you're 100 meters in front of the real land of San Francisco because they built all this Embarcadero area out of basically sunken boats and trash over the last hundred years, and now we have the Embarcadero of San Francisco. Out my back window, I'm in San Diego right now. Same thing. The entire Embarcadero built up is is quote unquote land that we created to do that. You know, go to Dubai and look at the the uh, the sandbars that they've created to create new real estate, go to the South China Sea and look at what China is doing in terms of creating literal, you know, land to create a, an airport, hundreds and hundreds of acres of land created. Who knows what we'll create in 10 to 20 years. Uh, and that, and that doesn't count uh, moving to interplanetary, becoming an interplanetary species. I mean, there are planets galore out there. I don't know if you've looked at the night sky anytime recently, but uh, last time I checked, there's a lot of, there's a lot of undiscovered land out there as well. And so, and maybe they'll understand that one, right? Maybe they'll be like, okay, yeah, I guess that's true, whatever. Um, you know, and then they'll pick some other scarce asset. Okay, what about gold? Okay, well, let's talk about gold, right? And same thing, we, you know, we're becoming, Jeff Bezos is going to mine some asteroid out there. Or, you know, if the price of gold became, uh, you know, $10,000 tomorrow, guess what? We'd all be gold miners. We'd all be trying to figure out ways to extrapolate all the gold out of the bottom of the ocean uh, or, or find new ways to mine gold. And, and gold miners are becoming more efficient every year. Um, and, then, and then I think my favorite one is when people say oil, which I just think is insane. But oil's, oil's an easy one, right? There are literal thousands of, uh, of oil derricks sitting, doing absolutely nothing in the Texas desert right now, in the Texas uh, or in West Texas right now, that if the price went from, I don't know what oil is right now, I think probably around 50 or $60 a barrel, but the price went up to 150, like it was a few years ago, all those oil days get turned on, the supply goes through the roof, 
uh, and the price comes back down. And Bitcoin's the only thing that that can't be done with, right? You can't turn on a bunch of new oil derricks and or new new Bitcoin miners, and all of a sudden we'll mine uh, twice as many. Because guess what? Two weeks, the new difficulty will come into place, and we'll go right back to a block every ten minutes. You may be able to mine a, a ton more Bitcoin for a very short period of time, but after two weeks, that's all you get. You know, um, and I and I and I think so. Understanding those two things, you you end up with security and scarcity. Those make things click for for individuals, is what I found, and then they can sort of go down the rabbit hole from there. And then I do every once in a while I get the question, okay. So now you've, you've taken away the power of the printer from the government. You've taken away the power of the money from the government. What does that mean for governance? Um, and that's where, the, the, that's where it gets interesting. Um, uh, you know, what does governance look like when a nation state can't print money to do their job? What does it look like? It looks like a, a government that is responsible to the people. It looks like a government that needs permission. Uh, you know, people... People want to argue about the pandemic, right? Well, without without the power of the printer, we wouldn't have been able to print money and, and allow people to stay home. Well, that's that's because we live in this reality in which the printer has become the way we solve our problems. But in a Bitcoin in a Bitcoin standard world, you could you have to you ask permission. I think that we are in a world where you could ask permission of people and say, "Hey, look, this is a really bad year this year. We need to help others out. We're going to raise taxes by one percent." for this year uh, and we will, we will see, and, and people will say, yeah, I think that is, that is a good thing to do. We need to help the world get back to where it is. Let's, let's help us, we'll tax a little bit more this year and, and, and let's, but that's a permissioned world. That's a, that's a place where you have to, you have to govern by the people, not govern by uh, what a individual who happens to be elected or in the case of the central bank, not elected, to do in a given year. And that's a world I would much rather live in, a permissioned world in which, uh, you know, and I think, I think, I think war and, and conflict is similar in that way too. Would, would a permissioned government be able to go and do some of the things that nation states do around the world in terms of inflicting violence on others? I don't think so. But in the case of, hey, uh, uh, Hitler is, is, uh, creating a Holocaust in, in Germany, we need to do something about this. Well, raising funds for that may be something that would, would be available, would be a permission thing. But again, governance by permission and governance by, by, by having to raise revenue via taxes is, is, is a world I would rather live in than let's allow five people in the central bank to print whatever money they want. Um, and, and that is, I think, a, a pill that most of my fellow fellow Marines can swallow when we think about what does that world look like? A world in which a government or governance needs to ask permission of its people, returning more power to the individual um, instead of relying on a centralized state, you know? And I think that's, that's where that conversation usually ends up. And, and that's, I've, I've had it with a few Marines. I've had it with a few, um, few people in the military. It, it usually is more, uh, you know, people don't always have the time or the energy to dig that far down, right? Most people are interested because the, the, it makes the money as an investment at first. Um, I can't tell you how many thousands of hours I have spent listening to podcasts, reading books, reading articles, sitting on Clubhouse, going on Twitter. Uh, and even, even with all that, I'm still at this place where you know, I have to humble myself in the face of this thing and say, I, I don't know sometimes, you know, I, I don't know what the future looks like. I don't know what uh, what a military looks like in a Bitcoin world necessarily. And I, don't, and I think anybody who does uh, either doesn't understand this far enough or uh, hasn't humbled themselves in the face of, of what this is. And I, every day I am humbled. You know, I think you, you sort of mentioned at the beginning of this, every once in a while, you have to just oh, take a breath and, and just let it settle and, and, and think about the consequences or the implications of what that world looks like it and even here i am you know four years into this of i don't think there's been a day that has gone by in the last four years that i haven't learned or tried to learn something new about bitcoin um and that's remarkable as somebody you know myself i'm i'm a bit of a add you know uh, cat's got a fuzzy new toy like 
uh, you know, every day, you know, you ask people who know me well, uh, there is, oh, John's got a, John's into something new. Like John, you know, he's into, he's into motorcycles, he's into sailing, he's into skydiving, he's in, you know, you name it. I'm jumping from thing to thing, but I, you know, this thing has caught my attention and held it more profoundly than anything else in my life. Uh, four years as a college education. And I have, I have definitely learned more in my four years of going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole than I did in my four years of college. Uh, and it is, it is remarkable. And I, I, for those people that I feel are still stuck in that world of um, being worried about, you know, for us, for us in America, you know, a lot of people that I spent a lot of time with, they were so worried about Donald Trump. They were worried about the changes that were going on in America. They were worried about white supremacy. They were worried about Black Lives Matter. And, and while those things are consequential and important, Bitcoin gave me the power to realize that a lot of these things can be solved by fixing the money. Uh, you know, I don't think it is an exaggeration, as you said earlier, fix money, you can fix everything. Uh, certainly there are things you know, it does not fix everything, but man, does it fix a lot of things, man, does it, does it give us a, a, a new platform to, to launch into a world that is positive and, and gives people opportunity levels playing fields, you know, I do come back to that idea of a permissionless money that allows individuals who otherwise would never have access. Uh, and, and I do find it remarkable that no matter what place you come from, you know, whether you're coming at it from finance or you're coming at it from a non-governmental organization or you're coming at it from the nonprofit space. You know, I had a friend of mine who uh, was in the Peace Corps and we talked a lot about Bitcoin. He, you know, he was like, well, that's, that's just money for tech people who are trying to get rich and blah, blah, blah. And, and I, you know, I, I walked him through, no, you know, you're thinking about the people that you were trying to help when you were on, in the Peace Corps. Um, you know, I think he was in, um, was he in Mali? Uh, and, and he was talking about the poor people that he was, he was working with. And, and I, and I talked to him, I was like, well, you know, what about the idea of, of as long as these people have a cell phone, as long as they have some basic internet access, they now have access to a financial network of the entire global world. You have people who can start businesses that would never be able to do that before. They don't need permission from their father or their husband if they're a woman that is that is underprivileged. They don't need permission from their government if they're in a, in a nation where their money is hyperinflating away. Um, they can access things that that heretofore was not accessible. Uh, and I think that makes people it makes people flip right. It makes people switch. Now those people who are reliant on the status quo to give them the, the same power that they've developed over the years, you know, whether it be working for JP Morgan or a hedge fund or whatever else, those people will be last to the party. They will be slow to the game because uh, in order to truly understand Bitcoin, you have to first get rid of those basic, those understand those things that you take for granted as truth. Uh, and it was something that took me a long time to get through. Was I had to, what sounds like conspiracy theory uh, when you first hear it, it's when that becomes truth, when you realize that there is truth in the, in the words that these people talk about, uh, and I've become one of them, uh, that you start to understand what Bitcoin is. And that takes a lot of unlearning. You know, I, I think that the, the trip down, the trip into Bitcoin is more, is in a lot of ways more an unlearning than a learning. Uh, you have to first eradicate the beliefs that you hold as, as undeniable truth, um, uh, as inalienable, uh, experiences that allow you to see the world that you see it. You have to unlearn a lot of that first. And um, some people are ready for it. Uh, some people are not. I think the, the, the great meme of the curve of, of individuals who understand Bitcoin, you have your super high intelligence and your super low intelligence. And then there's kind of this, this middle phrase that, that they live in a world that they understand is like, okay, this is how the world is. Uh, and anything that questions that, I will deny to my greatest ability. Um, and there are people who continue to understand it and get it. Uh, and then there are people who will eventually, right? I think the, the, the line, um, you, you get Bitcoin at the price you deserve is, is so, I find it to be extremely apt every time that I meet somebody who finally gets into Bitcoin or is considering getting into Bitcoin. You don't truly get it until you're ready for it. Uh, 
Uh, and that takes a lot of unlearning to get there. And it certainly was the case for me. You made so many points um, that are all beautifully interconnected. Um, some while ago, you, you talked about, you know, the costs of what are the main costs, you know, like whatever healthcare and, uh, and then you talked about education. I was going to interrupt you, but I was like, no, you, you're actually right. I mean, the conventional way, yes, the conventional educational system that costs a lot of money, especially the United States, you know. Um, right, right. So, and then you talked about, you know, actually, um, uh, or you were actually implying, you know, it, it either, you know, like people like you and me, I would, you know, count uh, the, the two of us and many other in, in this space as open-minded or critical thinkers, either, you know, you're born or you're somehow conditioned becoming open-minded and creative and, and critical thinker, or Bitcoin makes you, you know, open-minded yeah. and critical yeah. and, and, and curious, you know, right. and, and I mean, and, and you, you know, you mentioned how many thousands of hours, you know, you spend listening to podcasts, reading articles, whatever that is. It's, I mean, it, this is the, you know, whether, whether it's Bitcoin, or any other topic in the last 15, 20 years, uh, in my case, uh, you know, also in your case, um, uh, is, is probably, you know, by order of magnitude, more valuable, <laughs> more precious than anything, you know, I, I'd learned in school at the university, you know, right. and, um, and so, you know, and then you, and then another point you brought up, uh, which, which I totally agree with you, you know, people come in, most people you know, come in with, you know, yeah, there are people, you know, libertarian minded, whatever, but they come for the money, for the investment, for the, you know, yeah, they want to build up a future for themselves, but eventually you, you stay for the, for the bigger cause, for the bigger picture, for the ethos of it. So I like that, you know, they were all interconnected somehow. Yeah. And I think, I think the, uh, I can't tell you how many Bitcoiners I've talked to who have said something along the lines of, I would gladly give up all my Bitcoin if, if I could guarantee that the future I see for Bitcoin uh, could be guaranteed to, to occur, right? So yeah. I will gladly give up my stack if, if that means that for sure the world that I see, the future that I see would come to fruition, right? You come to be like, I'm going to be, you know, you come for the Lambos, right? And you, and you stay for... Uh, the world changing technology, right? You, you stay for, oh my God, there's this, finally there's this future. So, you know, I, I, I'll share kind of my, my personal story, which is just that, uh, you know, after being, you know, in Afghanistan twice and, and, and living through the financial crisis and, and sort of seeing these, what felt like inevitable limits of what we were capable of and limits of what the world could become, uh, that we would either descend into financial chaos or military chaos. Uh, and I, you know, I think Bitcoin has given me a view and a hope for the future that I didn't think that I didn't think was possible. I didn't think existed anymore. I thought, uh, there was sort of this inevitable, well, we're either going to blow ourselves up or we're going to screw up our system so badly that the world will, will suffer into such gross inequality that, uh, the future looks very bleak. Right. And, uh, and Bitcoin changed that for me. Um, it gave me a positive view of the future. It also made me start questioning lots of things that I think many people and especially Americans take for granted. And, and you start, when you start questioning, uh, basic things you've been taught, right. I think, I think the food, the food pyramid in the U S is a great example, right? So, so you're taught it from second grade on this this food pyramid that is just <laughs> totally, a total lie. I mean, it's such a scientific it's, fraud. It's, it's 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 absolute propaganda and and poisonous to you as an individual yeah. to us as a as a country. Uh, you know, sugar is toxic. It is. <laughs> Did you know uh, that Bitcoin made me to meat eater? I, I used to be vegan for six seven yeah, years. Right. Vegan man, yeah. you know, from I'm one day to another, and right. then it turned all. You know, I I changed my. You know, I, I, of course, you know, it was all the knowledge I acquired, but then I understood why I need amino acids and I mean, animal amino acids, but just, you know. <laughs> well, and I think, I think it opens your mind, like, like you said, it, either you are open-minded and you find Bitcoin or you find Bitcoin and you become open-minded. There is no, there are no closed-minded Bitcoiners, not really, not people who understand it, right? And, and I think it, when you start digging into Bitcoin, you, you know, I say this all the time. It's like, if you're not, if you're not pissed off, you're not paying attention. Right? If you're not upset about things you've been taught or things you've learned or, or things that people take for granted, then you're not paying enough attention. You're not, you haven't dug in far enough. 
And if you're not an orange pilled hardcore Bitcoiner, you haven't learned what Bitcoin is yet. You're, you're just not there. Uh, you know, I, I always laugh when I keep, meet people who say, oh, I used to be a Bitcoin maxi, but now I'm into whatever, you know, you know, pick your poison. I met a girl the other day on Twitter who said she was into Neo uh, as her, you know, she's like, I used to be a Bitcoin maxi, but now I'm, I'm now I'm into Neo. And I was like, well, then you were never a Bitcoin maxi. It just, it doesn't exist. I just truly don't believe it exists. I don't believe you can fully understand the implications of Bitcoin and then be, and then decide, no, that's, I'm, I'm actually into Ethereum or whatever it might be. Um, and, and maybe I'm wrong, you know, I, I strongly held beliefs, right? Uh, or, or, or strong beliefs weakly held, right? So I have strong beliefs, but I'm ready to change my mind if, if some information or something else comes along that, that, that I understand, oh, you know what? I must've missed something. You know what? Maybe I am a Neo Maxi now. I'm into, into Ethereum. I'm into, I don't know, Cardano or whatever these other coins that people pitch. Um, I just don't think that you've under, you've fully gone far enough into it. Yeah, because Bitcoin, you know, is the totality of rational, logical thinking and ethical principles. And, you know, the, whatever it's called, you know, the low time preference uh, and the fundamental principles uh, of, of, of everything that follows, you know. Well, Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is fire, right? So we've invented fire. You can't reinvent fire. There's no, you can't, you can't have better fire, right? The, so, uh, you know, I think, the idea of people who are like, well, I'm into blockchain. I'm, I'm into the blockchain technology, but not Bitcoin. It's like, so you're into rubbing sticks, but you're not into fire. Like, what, you know, what, what are you talking about? You know, what, what do you mean? Uh, you can only invent, you can only invent digital scarcity once. And we invented it. It's called Bitcoin. It's here. It's one the game's over. There will be second layers. There will be, you know, there will be side chains and atomic swaps and lightnings and other things that are put onto it. But, Bitcoin is the one that matters. And, you know, if you're worried about transaction fees, you were, you just haven't gone far enough yet. And that was me when I first came in the space. And I, I think I remember, you know, I, I was, I came at it from, okay, this is permissionless money that anybody in the world can use. And then I sent one of my first Bitcoin transactions and it cost me, you know, a dollar 20. And I was like, wait, 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 I can't, what are you talking about? I can't, this is not permissionless money. I, it's who's going to spend a dollar 20 to send money, you know, and, and that was my fight with my buddy. And, and he's like, no, 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 you got to keep going. Like, just, it's not about that. You, we're, we're replacing the base financial, let, you know, and, and all the things that I eventually started to learn. And, um, and then I, I understand it, right? When you're coming to space right now and you can, I think you could easily spend $12 on a transaction on, on the Bitcoin base layer right now. It's very hard to, to look at that as a totally new person and go, yes, this is the answer to all our problems when you're spending 10 to $20 on a transaction. Um, but when you realize what we're really trying to do and what, and then you start to, you start to understand what final settlement is. You start to understand what a store of value really is. You understand that there are, uh, you know, you start to compare it to TCP IP or the base layer of the internet versus all of the layers we have built on top of it, uh, all the way out to, you know, your phone and the apps that are on it. We're only 12 years into this experiment. Um, you have to, and it, it, that is that is something that I, I think is a hurdle and kind of why I hate bull markets. Uh, I much rather convince people in a bear market when nobody's really paying attention and you can, you can, you're not distracted by the price. Uh, you know, I've got people in now they're going through their first 20 to 30% drawdown and they're freaking out about the price. And uh, I've, I've got one, one good friend of mine who's really him and his wife are both, I'm really impressed with their descent into uh, how quickly they're sort of grasping it. And the great thing about where we are now is there's so many amazing resources, right? There's so many good books you can point people to, articles. Yeah, there are no excuses. There are really no excuses. It's you know, like whatever overwhelming, be. brilliant overwhelming. materials out there for right. free. Absolutely for brilliant. Free. And, you know? and there was and there was in 2017 to an extent if you knew where you were looking. But now, I mean, you know, with I think I think Michael Saylor really was a transition. Uh, gave sort of a, a he, his talks are remarkable uh, and the fact that he really put his money where his mouth was, um, you know, by putting billions of dollars into this thing, that's different than saying, Hey, I've got a friend who mined Bitcoin in 2011. He's a millionaire, you know, listen to him versus somebody who's showing up in 2020 and really saying, Hey, I understand this at a different level. Here's this monetary energy network. Let's get away from the word currency. Uh, I think cryptocurrency, just like, 
trying to describe the internet in the early days, you can't describe the new with the old. It is all, it will always be lacking, exactly. right? Yeah. Uh, you know, email, electronic mail is a complete misnomer from what mail is to an extent. You know, we can send digital attachments. We can, uh, we can send thousands of emails a day with zero cost to us. Uh, the words internet superhighway come to, come, to, mm -hmm. uh, come to mind, right? Or the web, right? These were words we used in the beginning of the internet to describe the internet. You know, go ahead and ask somebody, describe the internet to me today. It's an impossible task. Right. It, is a, it is a completely, and People so trying to describe Bitcoin it. is also an impossible task, right. right? Trying to describe to somebody what this is using the words like currency, fiat system, money, none of it encapsulates what Bitcoin is. It, and, and, you know, I, I think that, that, that Sailor gave us this, this term, you know, or, or really hammered home the idea of a monetary uh, energy network right which was which was the same as as uh as ford described you know way back when he was describing what we could create was sort of this this energy money network mm -hmm. right that's what bitcoin is right uh, we've been trying to invent and describe this for for over a century uh you know ford certainly wasn't the first but but definitely one of the most prominent that we sort of mm -hmm. quote today um and then and then also when you say why is bitcoin important versus the other ones I have a great graph of sort of the, the prehistory to Bitcoin that goes all the way back to the, to the 1970s. And you say, Bitcoin is the answer to a question that cryptographers and, and cypherpunks have been trying to answer for four decades. So when they say, well, this is the MySpace to Facebook, it's like, no, this is the answer to a question that has been sought after for decades. Uh, that is why it is important. It is not MySpace and we're going to eventually create Facebook and then we'll create whatever comes after Facebook. Um, it is truly uh, a remarkable, beautiful solution to a completely intractable problem. When you start telling about eCash and Bitgold and the prehistories that, that people like Nick Zabo and, and Hal Finney worked on, uh, and you realize there have been attempts and there were things that were close, they almost made it, but they just didn't have that magic, right? That, that combination of proof of work, blockchain, and, and an anonymous founder you know that that anonymous founder part is so important um as we're seeing today right you know facebook tries to come out with libra or whatever the hell that coin was that they were trying to come out senate draws senate drags them in front within six months and the project is completely dead uh nobody can drag satoshi nakamoto in front of the exactly system. yeah he will never he will never he will never appear and say yeah this is what i was creating this is what i made whatnot yeah um, and and it's those it's that magic combination um, that has created this amazing, beautiful thing. And, and it also created it and it allowed it to grow for the first few years in which mistakes could be made and not be catastrophic. And now we're 12 years in, people are paying attention, people are using it every day. I think it's a remarkable question when people ask me, well, you know, this isn't being used for, you know, when is it going to show up? When is the future going to be here? I'm like, you may not be living in the future, but I am. And the people that I hang out with on the internet are, and the people on Twitter are, they are using it every day. And they're like, well, what do you mean you're using it? Well, I'm using it because I store my value there. I'm using it because I have transferred things that I used to store my monetary energy in to this new thing. And just by owning it, I'm using it every single day. And that's hard to grasp people. Like, oh, you're not grasp, buying yeah. anything. With yeah. it. You're not, you're it's not such a mind it. shift. Yeah. <laughs> you're not using it for Bitcoin. You're not using, I'm like, well, I used to try to store my value in all these stocks and, right. and other vehicles because that, you know, and I used to kick myself when I would miss, you know, people ask, what is the most, what, what's the thing that Bitcoin has done for you more than anything else? Save you time. You know, I mean, how much time, time. and energy does it cost, you know, to do time all and these investments exactly. those, and those are the you know, two things. inflation those rate and this and that and, you know, so um, John, before I forget, let me let me ask you. So, okay, you know, we I think we we all agree, you know, in the Bitcoin space, it's gonna go beyond the moon. You know, it's going to supersede sure. uh, gold uh, market cap. The trillions are gonna flow. This is not what I'm concerned with. The you know the discussion we've had, you know, also with Eric Roscoe and uh, others or on Twitter, is like how is the state, the governments, the nation states, and that's why, you know, the military industrial intelligence complex going to react because the pain point hasn't been reached. What do you think 
I mean, I get that, you know, they're politicians, decision makers, their kids, their families, they already have skin in the game, you know, there's opportunity, there's already invested, there are a lot of people invest in this, you know, high, you know, super ethical, you know, senators like uh, Cynthia Lummis of Wyoming, right. they're all into what, you know, it's beautiful, you know, we got Bitcoiners right. now, you know, but right. the thing is, it's the power control obsessive structures I'm talking about. <laughs> this is what I'm curious. How are they going to react? Because if I were the state, I'm just putting myself into the shoes. It's not like I'm, you know, I don't know what they're capable of. But, and, you know, for me, it really doesn't make difference with it's the United States or any other thing. It's all the same. It's, it's the same power structure for me. So I, I think that, I think that Bitcoin is the, is the fifth turning, right? I, I'm sure you're familiar with the fourth turning. Maybe your listeners are as well. Um, If we look at if we look at uh, how and Strauss's um, fourth turning research, and I, you know, I don't know if you've read that book or not, but um, it you you have, and I and I've, I've read it recently again. Um, it it is this inevitable feeling of we are about to come up against another shift in uh, in the way that our society works, and generally that means massive conflict, war, civil war. You know, World War II, Revolutionary War, whatever you name it. Uh, Bitcoin, we're seeing it in real time. Uh, Bitcoin is this pressure relief valve that uh, that the states will adopt, uh, the nation states will adopt, and and with that comes desired efficiency. You cannot, you have to provide value in a Bitcoin world in order to extract value from others you have got to provide me some sort of value in order for me to give you my Bitcoin. In order for me to give you some Satoshis, you are going to have to provide value. And that will fundamentally transform the way the government exists. It will fundamentally transform the way that we govern. Uh, and you, na you, know, you may name Cynthia Lumens. You know, Biden has people in the Treasury Department that are Bitcoiners, um, you know, lawyers and, and former uh, former people working at, at Coinbase and, and, uh, and some of these other digital spaces uh, are now in the government. They are, and, and that gives me a lot of hope, right? Because the, the, other, op the other option is the government decides to fight this tooth and nail and, and creates massive destruction and violence in its wake. I just don't think that that is, uh, I don't think that's possible because people are waking up to what Bitcoin is every day and people in all power. There is not, there is not this world of a government that is no coiner government that will fight everything. And then this world of Bitcoiners over here, they are intermingling every day. Right. And, and the more people we can get to flip, to understand what this is and the power of what it is, the quicker government will adopt it. And then the quicker the government will have to adopt generally to Bitcoin creating value for its customers, right? Which is us, which are the governed, which are the people that make up the state. And so I think that we are headed to a place where uh, we have governed for the people by the people returns to be a true statement. Uh, what about were... regulation? What about, John, what about regulation taxation? This is the discussion also we have with Eric Bosco, like he said, you know, what if the government, you know, sort of creates or, or intends to create a sort of a white market, you know, we're at the intersection, you know, of users. Yeah, and Eric, purchase. you know, Eric, Eric believes that Bitcoin is, is a black market money and only black market money. That's all that's, we'll ever be. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I don't, I, I, Eric hasn't convinced me of, of that to be the only way possible going forward. And Eric is brilliant and much smarter than me and probably, and, and, uh, is very convincing and persuasive in the way that he understands Bitcoin. I believe that there is uh, a world in which, and as we're seeing, we are seeing Bitcoiners entering the government. So let's fast forward five to 10 years, right? Multiply those Bitcoiners by 10, 100. You have people who understand the power of this in places of power. Uh, you know, you look at, you know, you look at, at money and, and, and you look at, where legislation goes, especially in the United States and I'm sure everywhere else in the world, you look at the popularity of a legislation versus the money that is, that is behind a certain legislation. Uh, the money behind a certain legislation will pass almost one-to-one -one rate, right? 
if if there is a moneyed interest that can pass legislation that that will get passed versus uh, a popular legislation that doesn't have any money behind it will has a 50 you know it has almost no relation to whether or not it gets passed so uh, and I think the weed industry is a great example right so the weed industry uh, when it was completely illegal had very little political power to get legalized weed passed in the United States but as certain states and have become more open to legalized weed and taxing uh, the weed uh, business and cannabis industry in the United States, legislation has been passed in favor of more and more cannabis friendly uh, legislation. And that's because you have moneyed interests now. You have businesses that are building in value. Well, the great thing about Bitcoin is there's a lot of rich Bitcoiners. <laughs> there's a lot of money in Bitcoin. Uh, and you have moneyed interests who can push for positive legislation that or positive regulation towards Bitcoin. So that that could mean, you know, uh, not taxing certain expenditures below a certain threshold. We've seen this in other nations and maybe that will happen in America. You know, you can spend Bitcoin below a thousand dollars and it won't be counted as a property. You won't have to worry about figuring out what your cost basis is and how much uh, capital gains tax you own on that. And I could, I could absolutely see uh, that becoming, you know, I, I see a future in which positive legislation around Bitcoin uh, is more likely than negative legislation against Bitcoin because the value of Bitcoin will continue to grow and the money and interest will become more and more powerful. And I think that is, that is certainly the case when you see things like Tesla, one of the largest companies, you know, in America now, uh, buying $1.5 billion of Bitcoin. That is a... That is a watershed moment of uh, a large, powerful company, the richest man in the world, now is a Bitcoiner, or at least owns Bitcoin, and has an interest to see that continue into the future and into perpetuity. Um, I think we've we've crossed the Rubicon, and we cannot, and we will not go back from this being a uh, a force that cannot be denied. And and we'll see. You know, I think later this year. You know, whether it's Twitter or, you know, or Twitter or Apple or or Bank of New York Mellon, you know, giving credence to this space, you're not the government is not going to go to Tesla in a year when their one point five billion dollars worth of Bitcoin is now ten billion dollars worth of Bitcoin and say to them, hey, we're banning this. So you need to sell it or give it to us or whatever it might be. Um, you know, people love to point to the 61. Was it 6102 Act in the United States when when uh, FDR made gold illegal, uh, I don't think that's possible in the world of the, of the in the inter internet age. You know, we saw Mnuchin try to push through that that nonsense crypto legislation in December. Well, guess what? The internet is always awake, twenty four seven. We are here. We are ready <laughs> to attack. We are ready to to call BS on whatever you might push forward. And if somebody tried to push forward a Bitcoin legislation that said. Uh, we're confiscating all of your Bitcoin. Hey, Tesla, you need to give it to us. We'll pay you a fair market price for it. There's just no way. Not in not in the internet age. Not in the digital age where we can call BS on anything and everything 24/7. The Twitter army is ready the to 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 attack. And there are there's so much money and so many money and interest in a one trillion dollar asset that I don't see there being some massive crackdown in the United States against Bitcoin, because one, anybody who truly understands it knows that that's not actually possible, uh, as we've seen in nations like in China, where they try to ban it over and over again, as we're seeing currently in India, uh, where they, they keep saying it's banned, but people continue to trade around it with VPNs or physically trading Bitcoin, you know, using USB yeah. drives, and hardware wallets. Um, and the more that, and, and governments are, they're paying attention, right? Mm -hmm. They're seeing that this is not bannable. Uh, you want to you want to show your show that you have that the emperor has no clothing. Try to ban Bitcoin in your nation. See what happens. Uh, you will you see the very illegal. You can declare, but you can't ban it. I think you know this. Right, and you will you will, just, you will see you will see that the power you think you have is not actually the power. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but you said something interesting, John. You said, I mean, well, you maybe you implied that that uh, I mean, it's an open secret. You know, politicians, lawmakers, whatever the political structures are inherently, in my opinion, uh, corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> and bribable and corrupt so actually sure. 
and this is what I've been asking. Maybe it's too mature, premature at this time. And I think Max Kaiser mentioned this a, a couple of times. Say, like, you know, once you know, once there are so many, once Bitcoin reaches, uh, you know, astronomical market valuation, and and you know, per whatever per Bitcoin, I think we can eventually be able to buy laws. I mean, we 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 make the laws, that's right. right? Right. That's right. That's right. And no, that's no, I, I think absolutely, and I. I I was, you know, relatively hinting that, but there's a, I'll, I'll send you, a, there's a great chart that, that kind of, like I said, sort of uh, markets the popularity of a certain legislation, uh, which is essentially a straight line across the graph, and then whether or not the legislation passes, and that's marketed against the amount of money spent on that legislation. And right. the amount of money spent on legislation, you know, you look at that legislation that was, was uh, that like the Koch brothers, for instance, were put their money behind, uh, versus a legislation that protects a small minority community, uh, you know, it's 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 basically the money is spent, the legislation gets passed. Okay. And Max Kaiser talks about it all the time, right? Yeah. We are the money. We have the money. We will buy the laws. We will buy whatever we want. Um, and that that's that's always been the case. And and corruption, I think, is a is is a fair word, but I think it's just the way that the system is set up. It is it is set up in a way that you know, the Supreme Court said money is speech, right? You know, and, and uh, it doesn't, it, they have made the choice that uh, if, if you have the money, you can buy the laws. If you, if you have the money, you can buy the speech. Uh, that's, that, that money counts as speech and Bitcoiners are very rich uh, and they will get, they will only become richer um, as the price continues to go up. This just becomes a $10 trillion asset or becomes a $100 trillion asset or, you know, I think Saylor pointed at a three hundred trillion dollar asset last in the the Safedean, um Yeah, podcast. at least, yeah, maybe even four hundred. Who knows? You know, I mean, what's the real total? Right. What's total what's the real value? And then mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah. So I I do believe that uh, this idea that the U.S. is going to try to regulate out. Bitcoin and and now and let's look at you know let's look at Coinbase right Coinbase is now going to be a hundred billion dollar company when they become public whether it's in March or February oh, sorry March or, or April um, that is a credence to what has been built right that is that is a direct reflection of the power of this economy that is being built that is a that is a company that has been around since 2012 uh, that has been helping develop the Bitcoin space, whatever, however you feel about Coinbase, you know, the negatives and the positives. Uh, but that is an undeniable number. That is a number that puts them on par with somebody like Goldman Sachs. Uh, you have a, you have a company that people are looking at and saying, you, know, you still have people that, that, that look at, at Bitcoin as, uh, you know, magic internet money. Well, that magic internet money just built a hundred billion dollar company. That's going to rival yeah, and the side effects big, are going to be enormous. Yeah, it's the side effects. The effects. Yeah, it comes exactly. with that. It comes with that power. It comes with mm -hmm. that speech, um, and comes with that uh, the undeniability of the future that has been that has been built for the last twelve years, and it's continued to being built by some of the smartest people in the world. Uh, and I think that's. I'm. I'm both. I'm. I, I feel that Bitcoin has two things going for it. One is it's undeniability, uh, it's, it's absolute incentive market that it has built. Bitcoin doesn't need me or you or anybody else, right? It will be here regardless of us. But at the same time, the community has become the most power, some, one of the most powerful aspects of Bitcoin, right? It, it will survive without us, but man, it thrives with us. Uh, when you orange pill somebody every other day, I think I'm watching on Twitter, uh, Jordan Peterson be orange pilled in yeah. real time. That's amazing. Right? You're, yeah, you're, that'd you're be watching. awesome. I and mean, just yeah. for the, for the effect of it, you know. Right. You know, the audience is like like yeah. Joe Rogan. Uh, you know, has a who has an audience of 100 million people. You're watching, uh, you know, Michael Saylor who went down the rabbit hole and and he has a five billion dollar company and and uh, now owns you know I think between him and MicroStrategy they own 108. Uh, thousand Bitcoin now. Yeah, uh, you've got a you've got a Dubai sovereign wealth fund that's about to put a five billion dollars into Bitcoin. Uh, you've got you've got the richest man in the world memeing Dogecoin for fun because he's bored <laughs> on a Saturday. Uh, it's crazy. It's just okay. insane to watch. Uh, 
you know, I, I, I do, I do continue to be disappointed by some people. I think, I think Mark Cuban is probably my, my biggest disappointment. Uh-huh. Um, because I think he is so close to being, uh, a Bitcoiner, uh, but for whatever reason, he continues to deny it, um, calling it bananas yeah. or whatever. Another one is Peter done. Schiff. I mean, if it wasn't for Peter Schiff's son, you know, you Schiff, know I'm, I am convinced. I, this is what I'm, what I don't understand. Is that like a sophisticated strategy between father and son? In I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm convinced that Peter Schiff is, <laughs> I'm convinced that Peter Schiff is, is a moron, first of all. I, I just think he's, an, I, I think he's an idiot. Or, you know, he slides a fox, which I, I think he has built at this point. I think he missed Bitcoin, right? He missed it. Yeah. Uh, is he just salty or ignorant? Or I, I think he missed it. And then he built this, this personality that is, I am an anti Bitcoiner. He's got 400,000 followers on Twitter. And the only reason anybody cares at this point is because he continues to be an anti Bitcoiner. It gets him on Fox News or CNBC. Yeah, okay. It is his, it is his identity. Yeah. Um, it's his identity in the same way that flat earthers are, are, identified by being flat earthers even when they discover that hey guess what this is a totally ridiculous idea and that that the earth is not flat even through their own their own discoveries of basic you know high school science uh things that were discovered by you know (laughs) by roman scientists back in you know the the before before christ two thousand years ago they still cling to it because that's their identity now and that is peter schiff uh whether he is aware of it or not i'm i don't care i I don't know uh but he may be just unaware that he has created this cognitive dissonance that if he became a bitcoiner tomorrow maybe nobody would care about him anymore maybe nobody would listen to him nobody would invite him on cnn nobody would would regard him when talking about elon musk and maybe he's afraid to let go of that identity he has created and and i'm I, i agree i think it's great that spencer and him kind of play off and maybe maybe they're they turn off the computers the other day and laugh at each other and they look at their stack of 10,000 Bitcoin and they're just like, I can't believe <laughs> this <is> everybody. <laughs> uh, or maybe he truly <laughs> just missed it. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I've, I've run into this before where, where I have friends who, you know, had some money on Coinbase in 2014, were ready to buy some Bitcoin and just never pulled the trigger. And now here we are uh, a couple, 10, 10 or 100x later, and they just sort of are like, well, yeah, you know, I'm, it, it creates... Uh, damn it, I missed it. I'm going to go find some altcoin to replace my, my feeling of I missed it, um, which is just a really bad mistake. You know, every, I think everybody in the space feels like they should own more Bitcoin because they almost bought it at X dollars. Um, I certainly have that story. I'm sure you have that story. You know, yeah. uh, there are very few people who learn about Bitcoin and the next day sink their entire net wealth into it. It's just not a thing that happens. You know, maybe Chamath, I think, is a decent example of somebody who really grasped it early enough. Um, and there's a few others, whatnot, yeah. uh, but, uh, it does create, it isn't, it's it, the, the revolution. So I, I studied psychology in college it was part of my degree and, uh, the revelation of human behavior and watching people in real time, uh, fight their own psychology is fascinating in Bitcoin. It reveals it who you are and what you, what you hold dear so quickly. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really, you know, I can't name you how many people I pitched at an early price or uh, how many emails I wrote and said, my God, people, Bitcoin is under $10,000. What are you doing with yourselves? Please buy some, you know, if you have questions, like, let me know, you know, you know, when, when Bitcoin dropped below 5,000 last year in March it was, you know, the email. It, is, it is truly fascinating, the human psychology, you know, people are yeah. getting a, such, you know, a lot of friends are now so in such a FOMO mood and condition i mean it's unbelievable you know and you you know you preach and preach and you know years for years anyway john i've really had a blast i think we need to this uh, continue this discussion maybe with together with eric ruskell some other time yeah do you, do you have any final Absolutely. thoughts or anything we missed uh something important? um yeah i mean i'm sure we missed some things and I, i'm sure i spoke incorrectly or or inarticulately at some points um but i think that uh i think that the the importance of this is getting is, is getting past, for me, the, the thing that was getting past the monetary idea of this and, and getting really starting to dig into the philosophy behind it and the implications of what this means for a possible future. And, and uh, I, you know, I had an hour and a half discussion with a friend of mine who's just sort of getting into it last night. Um, and she was really stuck on like, she wants to, there, she wants there to be, she's, a, uh, she's getting her master's degree in sociology, um, and, or sorry, in social work. And she 
wants to be in Bitcoin, but she wants there to be a more uh, equal and fair world that we're building with it. And, and I think that is where the interesting conversations come in. And, and, and those Bitcoiners who aren't having those conversations yet, I think that's that I would just push your listeners to really, uh, if they're not there, uh, that's where the interesting stuff lives and, and try to get to a point where you're having conversations less about, wow, this is going to go to the moon and more about what does going to the moon mean for us? What is, what is our society and our cultures? How does it change? Um, because that's where the fascinating stuff is. And that's where, that's where the interesting stuff lives. And, and those are the conversations that I try to have as much as possible. Uh, I'm tired of explaining, you know, why this is a good investment or why it's, a, you know, why it's secure or any of that stuff. I'm glad to have them. Uh, it's interesting to talk to no coiners, like we said, because of the psychology behind it, but, uh, delving into your own, um, misconceptions or, or preconceived notions and, and figuring out what that, what needs to change and what that might look like in the future. Um, those are the interesting conversations and, and, you know, what we're talking about right now, this has been fantastic. Thank you for having me really on and talking about this. This has been great. Um, and, what can people uh, follow you, John? Or uh, I'm on, I'm on Twitter at, uh, you know, at John, Silvestro underscore or at John underscore Silvestro, you'll find me on there. Um, other than that, I, I've, I've uh, been working on a few other things, and but Twitter is mostly where you can find me. You can always DM me; my mine are open. So awesome! Hey, John, right. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. For, yeah, awesome. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. All your right, time and knowledge. Talk to you soon. All right. Saturday. Yeah, sounds good. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Okay. How is that? I really enjoyed this. God, I mean, um, this is a special topic. I'm, I want to go deeper into the rabbit hole, uh, talking about, you know, government, nation states, military, industrial intelligence complex, technologies, you know, what are the potentials? What are we about to face uh, with all the, you know, totalitarian, tyr tyrannical things going on in the background? So John Sylvester, you know, just gave me a, a totally new insights, perspectives, and, you know, uh, sharing his thoughts was really fascinating to me. So without, uh, yeah, going into much further details, just follow him on, on John Silvestro on Twitter. I'm going to put those in the show notes. And if you have any questions, any thoughts, comments, or suggestions for any panel discussions in this direction, let, just let me know. My email address is kb at kvandavani.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, my podcast show, with it broadcasted uh, to every other, you know, prominent platform. And my website is kvandavani.com slash podcast. If you want to go directly to my podcast on my website. And yeah, if you're a Bitcoin sponsor, get in touch with me, uh, DM me or email me at kd at kvandavani.com. And hope you enjoyed this. Talk to you soon. Bye.